The, the purpose of my lecture this afternoon is to present and discuss various uh, theories of interest and because we cannot do too much within one hour, especially if we want to leave some time for questions, I will focus on uh, four uh, main theories. Uh, we'll first uh, very briefly explain what the whole point of uh, interest theory is um, and then uh, discuss uh, the Marxist theory of interest, then the productivity theory of interest, and then the time preference theory of interest. And if we still have some time, we'll uh, discuss uh, the means ends theory of interest. Why are you laughing? Because <laughs> I know the originator of that. Uh huh. The originator. Oh. <laughs> uh, Okay, I, I don't like the word originator. It reminds me of uh, Marxist talk about fathers. Right? This is, you know, no, no longer fathers, they're just an originator. Well, anyway, so the, 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 point of, uh, the point of a theory of interest is to explain the whether and why there is a systematic difference, a systematic spread between sales revenues and cost expenditure. Okay? Let us first again, uh, with this very simple... Uh, diagram, passage of time, illustrate the, the basic logical structure of investment. Uh, we always have some investment taking place at a point of time T1, and then we have later income. Of course, typically, uh, the initial investment is spread out at different points of time. Usually, it's not one lump sum expenditure of money, and there's not one lump sum revenue, but the uh, Cost expenditure is spread out at different points of time and also spread out at uh, uh, other the sales revenues and sometimes this also overlaps, but we can neglect these complications because it doesn't change anything to the basic thing that cost expenditure comes first, sales revenue comes later. And so what we observe in a business that functions is that there is a positive spread between cost expenditure and uh, sales revenue, a business that does not work, is characterized by the fact that the revenue is lower than uh, the initial expenditure. Right? Then again, there's another complication that we can introduce by the fact that uh, sometimes we have to take into account the, the length of the overall investment. Is the uh, business profitable over one year? Often that's not the case. If you have a startup, it only gets profitable after five years or something, right? But we can again uh, abstract from these complications that for a given uh, investment period that we say counts for this business, a successful business will have a, a revenue that is higher than the initial expenditure and a bad business, a bad investment is characterized by the fact that the revenue is lower than the initial expenditure. Okay. Now, so we have here the spread. The spread is here 20 units of money, 20 ounces of gold, 20 million dollars, 200 billion euros or whatever, right? And the question is, what is the cause of this spread? Okay, what's the cause of this spread? We can call this here, this here is the, we can call this the gross surplus resulting from uh, investment. And this gross surplus is a complex phenomenon. It is uh, an overall visible uh, thing, as a sum of money that has, in fact, several causes. Uh, it's not just one cause at work here, there are several causes. So what are the causes that we can distinguish here? Uh, one theory is, uh, one, one cause is what the Austrians uh, call um, the pure rate of interest. This is the subject of our lecture today. Okay, so it's one element of this growth surplus. Uh, then we have uh, a price premium that is a compensation for the loss of purchasing power by the entrepreneur, right? the initial investment. Let's say, um, uh, so we have to take here account of the fact that uh, the money that is spent here at the point of time T1 might have a different purchasing power from the money that is spent at uh, T2. Okay. For example, consider the following uh, scenario. You have a credit uh, transaction between two people, a and B, Peter and Paul, and A lends money uh, in uh, 2000, uh, whatever, 8 
$1,000 to B and B pays back now we're not considering any interest here, he pays back the, the money $1,000 in 2009 okay so if the dollars do not change in, in purchasing power between 2008 and 2009, then B returns exactly the same amount than uh, he has been, been given. Now, what can happen is that the money uh, changes its purchasing power, and as we know from experience, that is, in particular, it can lose in purchasing power. Right? So, I will focus now on this case. So, in order to illustrate this, we must index the dollars. Can you guys see this over there? No. Okay. So, let's say, I will write this up here. I'll write this up here. So let's say uh, one dollar, two thousand eight. Can you read the the red stuff? Red pen? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I guess. I always like to take different colors. I'm a flowery person, so I <laughs> <laughs> red and green and, and orange. Okay. So one dollar. This goes right. This is okay. Two thousand eight equals one dollar, two thousand nine, and then we can also have, of course, one dollar, two thousand eight equals two. This is the first scenario, second scenario. Two dollars, purchasing power, two thousand nine. So in this case, A has an interest. A would give his money to B, not to be exchanged again for uh, for. $1,000 in 2009, unless he wished to make a gift to be, uh, to be, that's of course a possibility, but it would be a gift. If he wanted to be paid back what he had lent him, in terms of purchasing power, he would therefore ask that B return $2,000 in 2009. So we, then here in this uh, payment in 2009, so he would pay $2,000, there would be, there would have two components in fact. One would be the restitution of the principal of the sum, and one, uh, so principal, and the second component would be uh, a price premium, right? So the second thousand dollars they gives is a compensation for the loss of purchasing power for A. Okay, so this shows up here as a price premium. Price premium is uh, usually not hundred percent, right? Unless you are, have a, a really strong uh, inflation, uh, it's usually less, right? It's, it corresponds to what uh, is today called the inflation rate, right? which is the increase of the general price level, therefore the uh, loss of the purchasing power per unit of money. Okay, so the price premium is the inflation rate. And economists use the letter P for this to abbreviate this. Then we have another component here, <coughs> still in the growth surplus, and this other component then is the risk premium. So it's a compensation for the likelihood of not getting one's money back. And this likelihood is different according to different uh, industries, different according to different uh, products. Right? Uh, beer production is much less risky than uh, the production of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, top uh, furniture, uh, not furniture, um, furniture too, right, but uh, fashion. Haute couture, do you have a, a translation for this in, in English? Haute couture, okay, yeah, so the, the stuff that they sell, sell in, uh, in Paris and in Milan, okay, this, this kind of stuff is very risky because the, the market is uh, uh, changing in volume very quickly and in taste, so it's a terrible market. So, in order to invest in such a venture, you would ask for a high risk premium, okay, to compensate yourself for the, for the loss of, uh, for the likelihood of not being, not recovering your money at all. And the last component, is uh, what we call profit or loss. Now, in the sense of pure profit or economic profit, not in the sense of accounting profit. Right? Profit in the economic sense is uh, that additional amount of money that we earn um, because other inv uh, investors have not um, competed with us in our industry. Now, I'll explain to this to you who are interested in this in a later lecture when we'll deal with general equilibrium analysis in Austrian economics. Okay? So in this lecture then we'll deal with the particularity of profit and loss as compared to uh, this year, the pure rate of interest. So we'll leave this out for the moment. Our subject today is the pure rate of interest 
So one element of this growth surplus, this is observable, right? this is something that can be empirically verified, all this here is, if you wish, a theoretical construction, but it's not fictional, because we know that these things exist, there is such a thing as uh, uh, inflation rate, okay, there is such a thing as risk, there is such a thing as profit and loss, I'll expl as I'll explain to you in more detail, detail later. Right? There's something like entrepreneurial error. Profit and loss spring from entrepreneurial error. Now the question is, is there also something like the pure rate of interest? First question. Okay? Does this exist at all or is it a theoretical fiction? Then we would say, if it were a complete fiction, we would have to say that what we can observe has only three known causes. The inflation rate, the risk associated with the investment and entrepreneurial error. End of the story. All the rest is blah blah. Okay? So the first question we have to uh, raise and which is answered by all theories of interest is whether there is such a thing as a pure rate of interest. And the second question is then what explains this pure rate of interest? There are the, uh, have been always been economists who have denied that there is such a thing as a pure rate of interest. And uh, the most uh, important one is Schumpeter. Right? Josef Schumpeter was a uh, uh, fellow student of Ludwig von Mises. He was two years uh, younger. He was a member of Böhm Barwerk's uh, seminar. And he's a famous 20th century economist. And so some count him into the Austrian school. But usually those people who do so are not Austrian economists themselves. No Austrian economist would, would call Schumpeter an Austrian economist. Well, he was born in Austria, so he was <laughs> a native Austrian, but he was not a member of the Austrian school, uh, the Austrian school of economics. What Schumpeter did was to try to create a, a new synthesis between Visa and uh, Valras. Right? So Visa getting his uh, inspiration from uh, Menga and Javans, and bringing these two elements together, and Schumpeter then going the direction of mathematical general equilibrium theory a la Valras. Okay, we, we can leave this out. The problem of this account is, of course, that um, uh, the, the question would be, uh, why? what would be the incentive for people in general equilibrium to save? Right? If there were, was no payment for this uh, act of saving. Okay? The pure rate of interest is, so to say, a compensation for savings that, that take place. And savings uh, can take place out of two motivations. Right? One is you would save whether you are uh, paid for this or not. Right? For example, you put some money aside for your old age. Right? You want to have something to eat on once you're no longer able to live off your work. Right? So whether there is an interest rate being paid on your savings or not, you just save this money. Or you save money to build a house. Or you save money to pay for the vacation of uh, your wife. Or to pay for the education of your children. And so on. Right? So you save this money and you don't really care for the interest rate. But there's another part of savings that takes place because you are being paid for this. And this is so with all services that we provide. Uh, some we provide only for ourselves. But to the extent that we go beyond our proper needs, we do this usually because we are paid. Or we are being charitable. Okay, So if there would be no payment, if there would be just a, a compensation for the risk that we run and a compensation for the loss of purchasing power, there would be no additional incentive to provide this extra saving. Okay, So this theory that there is no pure ra rate of interest uh, uh, could not explain uh, why people save beyond their proper needs in a, uh, in a market economy. Uh, so it's a basic problem, basic criticism of this theory. Uh, socialist authors very often come up with this uh, theory. Another author uh, that was popular in his day is uh, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, a 19th century French uh, socialist who had a famous debate on uh, interest and banking with Frédéric Bastiat, uh, the great French uh, uh, proto-Austrian. Okay, so we rule this out and we turn now to the Marxist theory of interest. What's Marx's explanation of interest? According to Marx, all value is caused by labor and only by labor. 
So the reason that we can sell our product here for 120 units is that the labor that has been used to bring it about, to create it, has the value of 120. But our capitalist entrepreneur, the pig, <laughs> didn't pay the full value to the owners of the factors of production. In particular, he was exploiting the poor laborers. They didn't get their fair share. They didn't get their 120, which they created. They just got 100. Okay? That's the Marxist theory of value. It's an exploitation theory of interest. Right? All value derives from um, labor. Therefore, if there is a growth surplus that cannot be explained in other terms, uh, in, ter in terms of error, in terms of uh, risk, as a compensation, as an insurance payment for the compensation of risk, or as a uh, compensation for the loss of purchasing power, well, then it's, it's exclusively due to exploitation. Right? Uh, what are the critiques that have been brought up against uh, the, the Marxist theory? Well, uh, first of all, uh, we have to ask, uh, irrespective of the, the internal merit of the theory, how would this work out in practice? It would require no less than a cartel of all entrepreneurs. Right? Because if there is no cartel, if entrepreneurs are competing, then of course there is an incentive for each of them to bid up slightly more for labor, attract people to work for him, paying them a little bit more. Right? We'll prop up one evil competitor might step on, on, the, uh, on the scene and he might pay 105. Lacking solidarity with his fellow pigs. <laughs> <laughs> right, so he bids up the price for labor and therefore brings it closer to its true value but eradicating also the profit of the other guys, of the other entrepreneurs. Right? And of course there isn't, and he would, he would gain, why would he gain? Because, uh, he now can realize his, product, uh, his project, his investment project, which he had not been able to do before. Right? So he earns the money rather than the other guys. And the same incentive would now, of course, exist for other people as well. Right? Other entrepreneurs would also have the incentive to bid up the price for labor even more. Making money themselves, even though it's a little less than uh, the other guys have made before, but they might make it, not the other guys. Right? Until eventually... The total expenditure here comes to 120 or close to 120, 119.5. Okay? So, even if we don't look too deeply into the internal logical structure of Marx's uh, theory, it would require uh, formal grounds no less than a cartel between all entrepreneurs, all capitalists. Okay? Which is empirically uh, not the case. So, first critique of Marx. Second critique of Marx, and now we're getting to uh, uh, points that have been uh, discussed and brought up in, in, in a, magnific a magnificent work by Eugen von böhm -Bawerk. It's still in print. It's, a, it's an article that he published in 1896, I believe, with the title Karl Marx and the Close of His System. Uh, so look it up. We might even have it on sale here. But it's, it is in print, so it's, it's still available. So what uh, Bavak does is the following. He de delivers uh, a critique of Marx's uh, theory of value and then he also checks the theory against the facts. So what he says about the theory of value is the following. It's not true that all value derives from labor. That's a fundamental point. Uh, part of the value that a good has also derives from uh, its natural qualities that is, uh, from the raw material uh, that is involved here, from the natural factors. A diamond that you happen to find on the beach, if you are ever happy enough to find a diamond on the beach, <laughs> has its value not because you looked so hard and so on until you found it, but just because of its internal uh, uh, qualities and their relationship with human wants, right, that you, or human needs that you enjoy looking at diamonds and so on, right? And so we have one part of, uh, one cause of value that is not taken account of at all in Marx's uh, account. Then another problem, notorious problem, labor is not homogenous. Right? It's just uh, ludicrous to um, assume, as Marx does, that the services, let's say, of an opera singer are the quantitative multiple of the services provided by a worker in a coal mine. 
or something. It's not the case. Second uh, point, and here we come to uh, Bumbavak's comparison of this theory, uh, respectively of its implication, with what we can actually observe in practice, is the following. If Marx's theory were true, then it would imply that those industries and those firms, the capital investment of which is heavily into labor rather than capital, would realize higher uh, spreads, higher profits than other firms in which the investment goes more heavily into uh, equipment or natural uh, factors of production rather than labor. Uh, so low intensity industries should be less profitable than high uh, labor intensive industries. Uh, let's say you have one uh, uh, company here that, that uh, employs uh, 100, let's say this company employs 120 laborers that, that work for a, for a day and, and their, their work is worth whatever, one unit of, of money. So the value of the product after, on the second day is 120. You have another company that just employs uh, whatever, um, uh, 102. Uh, they would just, in, so 100, 102 uh, laborers, they would generate a, a revenue of 102 here. The initial investment would be 100 in both cases. So this means that those who employ less laborers relatively to uh, real capital, uh, to capital goods, earn a lower profit than the other ones who employ more human beings as compared to material factors of production. Now empirically, again, that's not true. And what we observed in actual practice is that there is a tendency toward the equalization of profit rates across industries. Uh, that's a big problem for the Marxist account. And Marx never answered this challenge, uh, well, among other things, <laughs> because he was dead at the time when Bernbalek was writing this. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was... Uh, well, Bumbabek, he was, uh, not all of these points were original with Bumbabek. Bumbabek is also summarizing certain points that had been brought up by earlier cri uh, critics of uh, Marx. So Marx never got to answer this difficulty. And uh, Frederick Engels, who eventually wrote the two last volumes of Das Kapital, uh, he solved this problem in the following way. way he asserted that the equalization of um, uh, profit rates uh, or that, that the labor theory of value holds true only in the aggregate. That is, it doesn't hold true for every single uh, industry, but also only for the industry as a whole, and right, for the economy as a whole. Then, of course, you have another problem. If, even if you accept this argument, you have the problem that you, are no, that you are unable then to explain individual prices. You are unable to explain this revenue here as compared to this revenue, right? Because... You abandon the claim, you say, well, I don't look at these individual data, I just look at the operation of the economy as a whole. And only for the economy as a whole, uh, the labor theory of value is supposed to hold. Right? So we have here kind of the foreshadowing of macroeconomics, your reasoning in, in terms of uh, fictitious aggregates, you abandon any quest of explaining individual observations. Okay, so we forget Marx, and we turn to the productivity theory of interest. Productivity theory of interest holds that interest results from the physical productivity of labor. Excuse me, from the physical productivity of the uh, production process. So if our productivity increases, then the interest rate increases as well. If the productivity diminishes, the inter uh, interest rate diminishes as, as well. Now... It is not, this, this sounds uh, superficially plausible, and it's really only su superficially plausible because as soon as you look a little bit at the thing in a little bit more detail, you see the, the problems. An interest rate is a ratio, right? We have, uh, for example, interest rate 2%. Okay. A physical productivity uh, is not a ratio, it's not a percentage. Physical productivity, at least in mo virtually all cases, let's say, for example, here we have a production... Uh, process, uh, we have whatever, 100 uh, tons of steel, right? and out of these 100 uh, tons of steel, uh, we produce, let's say, uh, 10,000 cars, cars of the type X. 
And of course, now we abstract from the fact that there are other factors of production also entering this process, right? Labor, for example, land services, and so on. How do we get from here, from this, to a percentage? We don't. Right? The productivity must be expressed as follows. It is 10,000 cars of the type X divided by 100 tons of steel. You can arrive at a percentage only if the unit is the same, but the unit is different here. Here it's cars, and here we have tons of steel, not the same unit. Therefore, you don't get a percentage. Right? You cannot eliminate the, um, uh, the unit in this, in this uh, relationship. You could do it if you had, for example, money entries. The, the amount of money uh, that you sell the cars for, for example, it could be $100 million, okay, and you divide this by uh, $50 million. Right? What you can do here is to eliminate the unit on both sides, and you get a, um, you get a percentage, 200%. Okay? But here we don't have this. So this is a basic difficulty already of the productivity theory uh, on, a, on a conceptual level. Therefore, in order to illustrate this, uh, those economists who have defended it, or some versions of it, for example, Paul Samuelson, uh, the famous neoclassical economist, now Grandpa Samuelson, he uh, gave a rice growing example. Right? So, say you have, uh, you plant uh, 100 uh, kilograms of rice, then the product of this rice that you plant is also rice. Okay, you get, for example, 120 kilograms right, of rice. And here then, we can create a, a ratio, right, a percentage. We can calculate a percentage. That is, at least if we abstract from the fact that we also use other factors of production here. We use also land again, right, and labor. So again, we need some heroic abstraction to get to the desired result, but at least we can, for one factor of production, we can calculate a real uh, the productivity in terms of a percentage. Okay. And without such a percentage, of course, we couldn't compare the different uh, production processes. So... What Samuelson says then is that as a consequence of this being so, of 100 kilograms of rice generating 120 kilograms of rice, uh, we get an, an interest rate of 20%. Right? Because this is a certain value here, it might have the value of 1000, and this is then the value of 1200, so we can see that there is a, a surplus generated of 20%. Okay. So if the productivity, the physical productivity of rice production increases, the interest rate will increase. If the physical pro productivity of rice production diminishes, the interest rate will diminish. Okay. Now that's wrong because we always, in economic na analysis, need to distinguish between three levels of uh, social reality. They are interrelated, but they are not the same. One level is the physical level. And that's why we had to talk about the law of returns and such things, as a purely physical level. And this here is the physical level, right? 100 kilograms of rice plus so and so much land plus so and so much fertilizer and labor can be turned into 120 kilograms of rice. The other question is, how does this look like from a value point of view? It's not necessarily the case that 100 kilograms of rice here are less valuable than the 120 kilograms there at a later point of time. does not at all follow. You might prefer 100 kilograms rice to have them right now, have a nice rice party or whatever for the entire town, rather than plant them and get 120 in the future. There's no necessity whatever that you prefer one thing to the other. And it's also not the same as the monetary level. There is the third layer of uh, reality that I mentioned. So we have physical value and we have monetary, okay, or the, the price, price uh, level layer of reality. Here, in this example, those who reason this way, such as Samuel Gilson, they stipulate that the uh, purchasing power of rice as the, the monetary price of rice is, so to say, Inbuilt, it's inherent in the rice itself. One kilogram of rice is always worth ten dollars, and that's in, it's, it's inherent monetary value, so to say. Therefore, at the future, it cannot be sold at a different price than thousand two hundred. Uh, but that's not the case. Uh, and uh, 
this is clear. So, for example, if we imagine that we have all kinds of production processes that will, uh, well, we have not only rice, but also tomato production or whatever, they all create a higher surplus, uh, higher product in the future. If the money supply does not increase, what will happen? Well, money will become relatively scarce as compared to these other goods. So the marginal value of money will increase relative to the marginal value of these other goods. So the money prices that are being paid for these goods will diminish. Right? So prices can very well diminish. 120 kilograms of rice might very well be sold at uh, a lower price than 1,200, for example, at 1,005 dollars, or even at 900 dollars, or at even at 800 dollars. It's not the slightest contradiction here. Right? So the basic error in the product, physical productivity theory of interest is to jump from the physical level immediately to the monetary level, to the price level. There is no necessary connection. If things were that simple, then any idiot con could be a great entrepreneur. Right? The problem in practice is precisely to identify those projects that will generate this higher revenue as compared to what you have invest invested initially. It's not because you create a physical surplus that therefore you also will create a monetary surplus. It's not that easy. Right? There is no a priori connection between the physical and this, this monetary level. Okay. So, therefore we forget about the productivity theory of interest. Oh, uh, as a, f a final nail in the coffin, we might again mention an argument that Böhm Barwerk has brought up against it. He said, look, even if this were true, Right? There would be an incentive for the entrepreneurs, for the different rice growers, to bid up this price here until it corresponds to this. Right? Why should this price stay indefinitely at, at a thousand? Right? It has to be because they are not uh, related. We can increase our own profit by paying a higher price for seed rice, for example, a uh, thousand one hundred. So we become now, as a new entrepreneur, he becomes the, the rice grower. He earns 100 units of money in, the, in this process. It's less than what the other guy, who would otherwise have realized this, this rice planting, would have earned. But he doesn't care that it's less because he earns it, not the other guy. Okay, so what prevents this? And the answer is, uh, there's no explanation of what could prevent it from the point of view of... Uh, the productivity theory of interest. Okay, so we close this chapter and we turn to the time preference theory of interest. The time preference theory comes in, um, comes in two forms. <coughs> One is the form that Böhm Barwerk has proposed, which was, um, uh, which are two uh, characteristic features. One it is a mixed theory, it's not a pure time preference theory. So Böhm Barwerk's uh, theory of interest, not a pure time preference theory. That is, according to Bembarwerk, physical productivity also played some role. This will lead me too, too far, but I cannot go, it's not quite as absurd as it might appear, but uh, I, I cannot go into this. So there are other factors. There is time preference, but there's also another factor. And uh, as far as time preference is concerned, it has a psychological root. So of a psychological uh, theory. In distinct contrast to this, we have Mises' theory of interest, which is a pure time preference theory, and which is praxeological, not psychological. Okay, let's go into a little bit more detail. So, Bim Bavak says the following. He says, the reason, ultimately, the ultimate cause of, uh, of interest, or let's say the immediate cause of interest, is that there is such a thing as time preference. Other things being equal, each human being tends to prefer a present good as compared to a future good of the same quality. I prefer an apple now rather than later. I prefer $100 now rather than later. And as a consequence, in order to incite me to give up a good if I'm the owner of the good in question, in order to incite me to give it up and get it back later, one has to pay me a little extra. If I give my, up my apple now, I want back in the future not only the apple, but something on top of this. A pair, or five dollars, or whatever. Right? And this little extra is the compensation for our time preference, that's the interest. Right? 
similarly, from the point of view of somebody who has not yet got this good, who would like to have the apple, or who would like to have the hundred dollars but doesn't have it him, himself, he is ready to give in the future a higher quantity of, of the same good uh, as an expression of, of his time preference. So he pays, so to say, a higher price uh, for the good now because he prefers to have it now rather than later. Uh, I know that I will get hundred dollars in uh, in one uh, week, right? For example, because uh, uh, my cousin promised to pay, pay pay back an old debt. Now I go to somebody and say, "Well, can you give me a credit? Can you lend me some money? Lend me uh, lend me ninety five. I'll give you back hundred next week. I know that I will have the hundred next week." Or I think I know that I'll have the hundred in the next week. So I'm accepting a lower uh, payment right now in exchange for a higher payment that I will make in the future as a consequence of the fact that I prefer 95 right now rather than having to wait for, uh, for a week to get the hundred. Okay, so the thing works both ways from the point of view of those who own the goods already and from the point of view of those who want to have the, those goods. Uh, so there's always a difference between the two payments uh, that emerges and which arises as a compensation for a time preference. So the, there is such a thing as a pure rate of interest, there is such a thing as pure interest, and it arises due to the fact, to the presence of time preference. Now again, Bumbadak uh, uh, gives uh, also a third course, but we'll, we won't go into this. In any case, what interest is uh, that he gives a psychological explanation of time preference. Why do we have a time preference? And what's the so time preference is the immediate cause of the interest rate. It's not the ultimate cause. The ultimate cause is a psychological fact, and it's the uh, so he gives several reasons. For example, he says that uh, as a tendency, we tend to um, uh, underestimate our future needs as compared to our present needs, and so we tend to underestimate the importance of uh, future goods as compared to present goods. Uh, so we have a psychological account of, of this sort. Now, uh, because of these characteristics, we can immediately see, uh, see what the problems are. First of all, it's, it's, so th these are the criticisms that Mises has directly and indirectly formulated, but Mises not alone, right? Other people like, for example, um, Frank uh, Fetter, right? an American economist of the of the turn of the 19th through the 20th century and a, a famous uh, pioneer of the pure time preference theory of interest. So they say, well, the one problem, one uh, important problem of Bobak's theory is that it is not yet a, a unified theory. It's not a coherent theory. Right? Because we have two strands of argument next to one another, Bobak thinks that physical productivity also plays some role, but this runs counter to his critique of physical productivity theories in, in other writings. Right? So we have a contradictory account uh, of interest. Second, because the uh, explanation is of a psychological nature, uh, we are somewhat um, uh, at a loss to give a universal explanation of interest. Right? At best, we could give a contingent explanation of interest. Sometimes there is such a thing as a pure rate of interest. Sometimes there is not. All, it all depends on the psychological disposition of uh, the acting persons in question. They might change their evaluation of future goods according, uh, as compared to, to present goods, so there is no reason why there should be a pure rate of interest. In particular, we could, for example, educate the whole population and say, hey, don't overrate present goods. They're not that important. Look at, at our bright future, whatever, it's our socialist or German paradise and so on. And you will uh, get uh, uh, all these goods that will exist in the future should have a much higher value for you than the, the present goods that is, exist right now. And as a consequence, interest rates should disappear if Grimbabek was right. right? Which uh, seems to appear problematic if we keep in mind what I told you at the beginning. Right? We have this fact that uh, interest is a compensation for, for savers to make an additional saving effort beyond the um, uh, the savings that they would make for their own use. 
So it's because of these weaknesses that Mises reformulated the time preference theory of interest and adopted a version of the pure time preference theory of interest, uh, which was, as I told you, pioneered by Frank Fetter. And the reason why I talk about Mises and not about uh, Fetter is uh, not only that we are here at the Mises Institute, would be a wrong academic uh, explanation, but because Mises tried to give it especially as a, a new scientific uh, grounding, a praxeological explanation of uh, this pure time preference theory. So time preference is the only cause at, at stake, and uh, it can be explained in purely praxeological terms, not psychological terms. And if, if Mises is right, it would follow from this that uh, the interest rate exists under all circumstances, that is, wherever we have uh, a division of labor uh, based on human action, right? because it's implied in human action itself that there is such a thing as a higher value of uh, these future goods as compared to the present goods. So what is Mises' explanation of this? Well, he says, um, basically, that Whatever we are doing, whenever we are acting, we prefer to obtain the result sooner rather than later. And that's the very point of, uh, of acting. And because otherwise I would just wait, I would, would do nothing. The reason why I do what I do is to bring about this result sooner rather than later. I eat my sandwich in order to still my hunger, precisely because I don't want to wait until next week or next month, but want to still the hunger right now. I built the bridge, I want to get the job done sooner rather than next century or something else. So whatever we are doing, we prefer to have the result sooner rather than later. So the sooner has a higher, always a higher subjective value than the later. It's not a psychological question, right? But I have uh, sometimes a preference for present goods as compared to future goods. I always prefer the result of my action sooner rather than later. It's implied in the very fa fact of, of human action, uh, in the action axiom, action, so to say. Now, this seems to be a very uh, strong account, and it is, uh, it is very strong, uh, but, but still there are grounds on which we can criticize it, uh, which I will present now. So lo let's look again at this here, this uh, basic logical structure of investment, and the problem of Mises' argument is that he cannot connect these two payments, or these two revenues. He can explain with this theory, with this account, each individual revenue, each individual payment, each individual price, but not the relationship that exists between the two. <coughs> Following Mises, for example, we could say that the entrepreneur, when he pays 100 units of money, 100 million dollars, to obtain the factors of production, that he wants those factors of production sooner rather than later. I mean, that certainly follows. And by implication also, he wants to get the, the result, that is the product, sooner rather than later. Okay? And it's also true that when the entrepreneur sells his product at 120, this is also because he wants to obtain this revenue sooner rather than later. But there is no connection between this payment and this. In fact, the same reasoning would hold true Whatever this amount here was, if it were 90, as in, as in this case in red, so the company is in fact not earning any, any interest, Mises' argument would still hold true. He pays 100 now in order to obtain the factors of production and the product sooner rather than later, and he sells then eventually the product to obtain this revenue sooner rather than later, certainly implied in this very action. But it doesn't explain why there should ever be a positive spread. See this point? This is a logical... Uh, difficulty. So it's every single claim that Mises uh, makes is, is correct, but it doesn't add up. Uh, finally, we don't get an explanation of this, and in particular of this component here, of the pure rate of interest. Okay. So what's, uh, what's the way out? How can we uh, get out of this? I uh, proposed a, a solution in an article that I published in 2002 with the title uh, A Theory of Interest in the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, in which I present not all of the, the stuff that I've discussed uh, this afternoon, but in which I present a more detailed criticism of Mises' theory of interest. Right? 
And by the way, for those who are really interested in this, there has been a response to my critique of Mises by uh, Pat, uh, what's his name? No? Yeah. No, not, not Pat Barnett, yeah. Gunning, Gunning thank you. Pat, uh, Pat Gunning, um, he's also a professor of economics. Uh, on the, so it's not been published in a journal, but it's available on, on, on the web. And of course, I think he's wrong, but um, I haven't yet replied to this, so everybody should make up his mind. Uh, just by reading this. It's, in any case, it's a polite, it's, a, it's an intelligent criticism. So, uh, this 2002 article, they are present, so, so my uh, approach, my explanation of this, and for name of a better, for lack of a better name, I tried, didn't try to give it a name, I would call it here means and theory of interest, because the central element in the explanation is the value relationship that exists between means and ends. Every means has, in fact, by its very nature, a lower subjective value than the end. And that is, again, by, the very, uh, by virtue of the very fact that it is just a means to an end. And the ultimate purpose of the, 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 the reason why we u take recourse to a means is to achieve the end. The means is not an end in itself. If it were an end to, it, uh, to itself, its value would be equal to itself. Right? So we don't have this problem. If the means is different, physically different from the end, then necessarily its value must be lower than the value of the end because the point of using this means is only to achieve the end. Right? So there's always the fact that means have a lo lower subjective value than ends. And it's not difficult to see that this gives us the connection between this and this, a connection that is, that is lacking in, in Mises' account. Okay? So we always, through our actions, try to achieve a result that for us subjectively has a higher value than the means that we mobilize, that we use to achieve this end. Now, it doesn't follow, therefore, that in all single uh, uh, way, projects in which we spend money, we earn a higher monetary uh, return. Right? There are many things on which we spend money on which we don't get any more money out. Again, building a house, except when you have a housing boom, <laughs> uh, spending money on the education of your children, Usually there's no money, monetary return for yourself. Uh, usually uh, uh, buying gifts for your wives and cousins and so on, usually there's no such thing. Charitable investments, you, know, you make a donation to the Mises Institute <laughs> or you, to, to a hospital that is building your community and so on, there's no monetary return on this either. But still, in every single case, right, the, the end has a higher value than the means that you use. If you give $1,000 for a hospital and you never get a, a dime out of this, then still the end, namely that the hospital exists and is operating, is more valuable to you personally than the $1,000 that you have invested. Okay. Now, some investments are, of course, made to obtain a higher revenue. Right? And it, it follows, therefore, that uh, the entrepreneur approaches the... Um, uh, the investment with the following mindset, he says, well, what can I realize as a revenue? And if I want to realize this revenue, I have to deduct a certain amount of money uh, intellectually and spend only a certain maximum amount of money here. For example, I want to earn 20 units of money right, on this project. We abstract from all the other causes that here also at work. And I think that I, by, through this project, I will earn 120. Then I should pay only 100 as a maximum now, lest I would drop the project completely. I would not even start it. Right? So that's, this is how I approach reality and say, okay, now let's go to the market and see whether I can get my factors of production for 100, uh, for 100 units of money. Right? So I need so and so many people to work for me. I need this and that piece of land and these and that material equipments. I add their prices up. If it's 100 or lower, I start the project. If it's more than 100, I don't start the project. And that is why, if entrepreneurs correctly anticipate the future revenue stream, there will be a tendency toward the emergence of a real, excuse me, of a pure interest rate on the market. It results as a consequence of the desire of entrepreneurs to realize this uh, this revenue uh, because of the fact that he wants 
that the means that he employs have a a lower value for him than uh, the ends, namely this amount of money that he wants to achieve. Okay, now I've spoken for almost uh, one hour. Thank you for your attention. And we have about two minutes for questions. Yeah. Louder, louder. Well, you need to attend the other lecture. Yeah, yeah. Because I would anticipate now too much. But I'll explain this. It's a general equilibrium analysis in Austrian economics. You have a plan? Which, which day is it? It's, it's not, they, they took it out of the program? Oh, it's terrible. Oh. Oh. Huh. You've not been circling my lectures. Why, why is that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that, that's too bad. So I have to explain it now, right? Maybe you could stay behind that for the end. Yeah. Well, the difference, uh, very briefly said, very briefly said, the difference is that profit and interest arise as a consequence of uh, entrepreneurial error. Okay? You have two investment projects. Uh, we can compare this very briefly. Okay, with these uh, payment streams, you get here a revenue of 140 on an investment of 90. You get 110 on 105 of investment. Okay, so you have different rates of of return. If we abstract now from all other things, all right, so you get here less than 5 percent and here more than uh, uh, 50 percent. What this will entail is a uh, is arbitrage, and it will be in the next round. Right, because it, to the extent that entrepreneurs want to, well, uh, increase their revenue, the guy who has invested here has clearly has made an error, right? Unless he was prevented from investing here. If there was, uh, is a free market and he can go into this industry, he will take out money here. For example, he will take the 110 that he has realized here, a part of this, and invest it in, in this other industry. So what will happen is that this price goes up, let's say to 100, okay? And this price here will go down because he spends less. As a consequence, the revenue here will fall and the revenue here will increase. Now, that's unfortunately not something that I can show now in detail, right? But that's, that's the result. And the result is, conform to common sense, there will be an equalization of rates of return in all investment products. Okay? Now, the rate of return that subsists once the arbitrage is complete once it is perfect, is called the pure rate of interest. Okay? And profit and loss are those extra payments or lacking payments that e- exist as long as the arbitrage is not perfect. What we can do now, if, for example, we can compare the blue figures to the black figures. We can see in general equilibrium, uh, the, the rate of return would have been 20%. But in fact, he's earning way more than 20%. He's earning 50%. So he earns 20% plus 30% extra. This 30% extra is his profit rate. That's pure profit. And he makes on top of the pure interest rate. And the other guy, he makes less than he would earn in general equilibrium. And this less is called a pure loss. Okay, not an accounting loss, a pure loss. Right? And so we see that uh, profit is caused by entrepreneurial error, not of the entrepreneur who invests here, but by error by those who do not compete him here. Okay? Entrepreneurial uh, loss is always due to the error of the investor himself. Profit always due to the errors of the other guys. (laughs) Okay. Very briefly. Yeah. No, 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 yeah, no, it, no, it doesn't relate really. No, because what you need in the, uh, you mean because uh, the Austrian theory of the business cycle, uh, yeah, well, you would have, look, whatever the cause of interest, of the interest rate is, right, you always have an equal, uh, equilibration going on in the different stages of production. There tends to be the same rate of return that is the same pure interest rate in all stages of production, whatever the concrete cause of it, right? So you still get a disequilibrium artificially created by pumping money into the market and artificially lowering the interest rate. Right? Right? So you still, the Austrian story still holds, even if the concrete reason for the cause of interest, of the pure interest rate is a different one. Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics. Yes. 2002. Last question. Uh, it seems 
why you get that number. Go back to the reference schedule, to your friends and the, the market and the, the price of future. Uh, no, uh, you, you don't because what the entrepreneur starts, he wants to realize a monetary revenue. Okay, that's his point. We don't care about, a, about his time preference and so on. Right? He knows that his revenue, of course, will obtain in the future. Right? So he must know in order to obtain the, these 20 units, in the, they are not in between. Right? He will realize them in the future. To make them in the future, he must now spend less on the factors of production needed to bring this about. How did he decide on, I mean, not start the project, if loan and savings market, yeah. if he can make it? Sure. Yeah, so that is, of course, subjective. It's different from one individual to another. Uh, for some, uh, the, the value spread between means and ends is extremely high. For some, it's, it's, it's very low. And on the market, we get, as in all uh, pr pricing schemes, we get a uh, 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 conglomerate result of all these different individual value scales. Okay, thank you for your attention.